Hello, humans. All right, so a brother of Christ wrote to me, and he said, How did Judas give back the money if it said that he bought land with it? Asking as a Christian. Okay. And then a Muslim also wrote to me and said, In Acts 1.18, Judas bought a field. And Matthew 27, 3-5 says he didn't bought, Judas threw the money into the temple. Okay. Now, I already addressed the uh, apparent contradiction of the death of Judas. Now, you can either read about that in my article or watch it on my YouTube video. But, as for the money and the purchase of the field, let's first examine what is actually written and then let's investigate the details. Remember, as dedicated detectives and diligent disciples, details are important. Now, some people would say, the devil is in the details. I prefer to say, the truth is within the details, and the details will lead us to the Lord. So, in Mark 14, 10 to 11, it is written that Judas went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus. And the religious leaders were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. However, Mark's account does not mention how much money the chief priests were willing to give Judas. So, in Matthew 26, 14-16, it says, Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, Well, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Well, however, neither Matthew nor Mark informs us as to why Judas went to the chief priests. But Luke 22.3 provides us with a little more information in that Satan entered into Judas before Judas talked to the chief priest. And so, I hope that you, as an investigator, realize the importance of comparing and contrasting all available evidence. Even with the matter of the money, we needed three different eyewitness accounts to put the whole picture together. So, Luke informed us that Satan had entered into Judas, Mark informed us that the chief priests were glad to hear from Judas and that they promised to give him money, but Matthew informed us how much money they gave him. Now later, Matthew 27, 3-10 says, Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, Well, it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it is the price of blood. And they conferred together and with the money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Well, now wait a minute. Pause. we got to pause the story right there. So, it is written that the potter's field, or the field of blood, had been a fulfillment of prophecy spoken by Jeremiah. However, the scripture being referenced seems to be from Zechariah 11, 12-13, which says, They weighed out thirty shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. But, on the other hand, you see, Matthew's rendering is not an exact quote from any passage. Jeremiah could have been associated with this due to Jeremiah 18, 1-4, 19, 1-11, and 32, 6-15. And this is where Jeremiah talks about the potter's house and purchasing a field. Now, in those ancient times, Jeremiah was considered the collector of some of the prophet's writings, and so it is possible that the prophecy was associated with Jeremiah, and Zechariah simply didn't get the credit. But it seems likely, however, that Matthew combined various elements of all the aforementioned scriptures in order to make his point. Why do I say this? You'll see soon. Uh, now, because Jeremiah was a major prophet rather than a minor prophet, Matthew probably used Jeremiah's name as the sum of all prophecy. In fact, look, Matthew did this earlier in Matthew 2, 5-6, where he seems to cite from several different passages. 
It was a common practice of the day to cite the more popular prophet if they cited the name of the prophet at all. So in fact, in Matthew 2, 5-6, if you see, even though Matthew mainly cited Micah, Matthew never mentioned him by name. Rather, he simply says, for this is what has been written by the prophet. So, is this a contradiction? Well, no. In those ancient times, the Jews were expected to know scripture. And so when Matthew summarizes what has been said by the prophets, the audience would have been able to understand. Now the problem here is that critics try to force modern standards upon an ancient society whose standards were completely different. Critics often point to variations in the New Testament use of Old Testament scriptures as a proof of error, but see they forget that every citation it does not need to be an exact quotation. Now, in regards to quotations, even we in this modern day sometimes use indirect quotations. Now, we call this a paraphrase of what had been said. And so, it was then and it is today. It's a perfectly acceptable literary style to give the essence of a statement without using precisely the same words. Many people paraphrase what they heard rather than reciting it verbatim. Look, they didn't have technology back then. They had memory. Now, whereas 21st century humans have access to all scriptures in a single app on a phone, 1st century humans had only their memory and very few scrolls. Now, for this reason, the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote, But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? <laughs> now, even though the author of the book of Hebrews couldn't remember exactly where it had been written. Well, we know now through investigation that he had cited Psalm 8, 4 to 6. Look, even Jesus, when he overturned tables and cleared the temple in Matthew 21, 13, said, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. Jesus did not cite where it was written or who wrote it, but after investigating all available scriptures, we now know Jesus cited both Isaiah and Jeremiah, and then he combined them into one statement. So, do New Testament citations of Old Testament need to be exact? No. The same meaning can be conveyed without using the same verbal expressions. Look, variations in the New Testament citations of the Old Testament fall into different categories. So sometimes they are due to a change of a speaker. So for example, it is recorded in Zechariah 12.10 that the Lord said, They will look on me whom they have pierced. But when this is cited in the New Testament, John, not God, is speaking. Consequently, it is reworded to they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now, at other times, writers cite only part of the Old Testament text. Now again, Jesus, as the example, he did this in Luke 4, 18-19, when he cited Isaiah 61, 1-2 at his home synagogue in Nazareth. But, you see, Jesus stopped reading in the middle of a sentence. Well, why did he do that? Well, because if he read the next part of that sentence in Isaiah 61 2, he could not have made his central point from the text, which you see in Luke 4 21, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, that's because the very next phrase in Isaiah 61 2 said, and the day of the vengeance of our God. Well, that refers to his second coming, not his first. So that's why he stopped mid-sentence and did not say that part. And so, sometimes the New Testament paraphrases or summarizes the Old Testament text, as previously mentioned in Matthew 2, 5-6, and others combine multiple texts into one statement, as we see in Matthew 27, 9-10. <laughs> now, occasionally, a general truth is mentioned uh, without citing a specific text. So, for example, in Matthew 2, 23, Matthew said Jesus came and lived in a city called Nazareth, and this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, take notice, Matthew did not mention the name of any prophet, but rather he said, 
prophets, plural, in general. Now, for this specific verse, Matthew is referring to a general theme. Several texts speak of the Messiah's lowliness. Uh, so, to be from Nazareth, a Nazarene, was a byword uh, for low status in Israel of Jesus' day. So Matthew was merely stating that the prophets foretold that the Messiah would be despised, as it is written in multiple places. Uh, and this is comparable to the way in which the town of Nazareth was despised in the time of Jesus. Therefore, if the New Testament writers cited Old Testament writings without being exact, well, they were not in error, nor did they contradict themselves, because we cannot impose our modern standard on ancient societies whose standards were different. Okay, now, go back, continuing with the topic here of Judas and the purchase of the field. Peter says in Acts 1, 16-19, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that the field was called Hakeldama, or that is, the field of blood. Now, when Acts 1.18 says, Judas acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, that does not mean that Judas directly purchased the field himself with his money. No, in fact, well, that would not have even been possible because Matthew 27, 3-10 informs us that, well, one, Judas didn't even have the money to buy the field because he threw the money before he left to hang himself. The money had been in the possession of the chief priest. And then two, he hanged himself, and Judas could not have purchased anything while hanging in a tree dead. No, Matthew's account makes it clear that the chief priest purchased the field with Judas's money. Therefore, Judas, through his blood money, through his wickedness, acquired the field in his name. So, for this reason, it is written that Judas acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. It was by his wickedness he acquired the field. So, in other words, the legacy Judas left behind was a field of blood which had been purchased with his blood money. But in whose possession was that blood money? The chief priests. Therefore, the chief priests purchased the field with the blood money, and so the field became known as the field of blood. Now, what is blood guilt? Well, it is the guilt that results from the shedding of innocent blood, the taking of an innocent life. Who was innocent? Christ Jesus. Why? Because he was without sin. Therefore, Judas, who incurred blood guilt, was impure. However, this impurity attached not just to the person, for the land was made ritually impure as well. The only way this, uh, this impurity could be removed was by the execution of the guilty individual, as we see in Numbers 35, 29 to 34. It is for this reason that Jesus, speaking to Pilate in John 19, 11, said, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Well, this leads us to a curious question. Who delivered Jesus to Pilate? Now, though the angry mob in Matthew 27, 25 shouted, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Well, we know that they were not truly the guilty party because Jesus later said while well, he was dying on the cross. In Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, why is that important? Because there is a distinction between intentional and unintentional sins. The people sinned unintentionally out from their ignorance, whereas Judas, who knew Jesus personally, walked with him for the years that he did ministry, he intentionally sinned and was the one 
who ultimately was responsible for Jesus being delivered to Pilate. However, all of the religious leaders who conspired with Judas were also guilty, and they had even committed the unforgivable sin by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And if Judas were to be executed in order to restore the purity of the land, the person responsible uh, for carrying out the sentence was referred to as the avenger of blood. But God declared that he himself is the avenger. Mm. Thus, the death of Judas should have restored the purity of the land, but then the blood money used to purchase the field made it known as the field of blood. It was impure. In addition, the religious leaders were still alive, and so the land was still considered ritually impure because of their blood guilt. However, in 70 AD, God, the Avenger, enacted judgment upon the land, and every stone had been torn down, just as Jesus said it would happen in Luke 21, 5 6. Now, if we investigate this picture, uh, uh, the purchase of the field, even deeper, if we dig deeper, we can examine the specific words used between the two passages. So in Matthew 27, 7, the word bought is the Greek word agorazo, which means to buy or purchase in the marketplace. In Acts 1.18, the word acquired is the Greek word katomai, which means to acquire, possess, or procure a thing for oneself. Now, for example, this word was used in Luke 21.19 when Jesus, speaking about the end time persecution, said, by your endurance, you will katomai. You will gain your lives. So, you will acquire your lives. Now, in essence, this is the consequence of an action. And that's why in uh, Acts 1.18 says that the field Judas acquired was out from the price of his wickedness. It was a consequence from his action. Now, that word price is the Greek word mesthas which means the fruit naturally resulting from your actions, from what you toil or endeavor. And so it could mean a reward or punishment, depending upon context. In Matthew 5.12, Jesus used this word to uh, promise that the righteous person's mythos, his reward, is in heaven. And again, Jesus used this word in Matthew 6, 1, when he said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward, mistas, with your Father who is in heaven. And in Matthew 6, 5, Jesus said, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. They have their mistas. So, now, let's return to what Judas believed was his reward, which was the 30 shekels of silver. Now, though Judas believed the money was his reward, his physical death became his mythos, his punishment. So, his reward ended up being his own death. Now, consequently, the field of blood became his legacy on this earth in this life. However, his spiritual reward would not be found in heaven. He did not store up for himself treasure in heaven. Instead, he attempted to uh, store up for himself treasure here on earth, not being rich toward God, which plunged him into destruction. Now, why is the price of 30 silver shekels significant? because that's the price of a slave as listed in Exodus 21:32. Listen, the depth beyond the surface reveals that Jesus became the slave so that we could be set free. He took our place. What did Jesus say? It is written in John 8:31 to 36. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. For this reason, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Paul reminds us in Romans 6, 6 to 11, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then Paul continues in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, how are we set free from the slavery of sin? Faith in Christ Jesus' finished works of his sacrificial death and resurrection. How are we pardoned from judgment of our sins which amounts to death? Faith in Christ. If the sentence by the judge is a price we cannot pay, we cannot be pardoned. However, Jesus paid the price of death for us on our behalf. For this reason, it is written that he became the expiation or propitiation for our sins through his blood. Now that word propitiation is the Greek word halasmas, which means the atonement of sin, the removal of guilt, and the appeasement or satisfaction of justice or punishment. And this atonement or appeasement is the connection to forgiveness, being pardoned. Now, so in conclusion, Judas threw the money at the chief priests, and then he left their presence and hanged himself. The religious leaders used that blood money to purchase a field, which became known as the field of blood. Judas's reward was nothing more than blood guilt, his death, and his name associated with that field of blood. Judas did not directly purchase the field with his money, but he did indirectly purchase the field with his wickedness because his blood money had been used for the purchase. Though the purchase of the field is an apparent contradiction, it's not an actual contradiction. The problem comes from the critic reading God's word, not the word itself. The mistakes are not in the revelation of God, but are in the misinterpretations of the critic. The Bible is without mistake, but the critics are not.